Does low blood flow actually cause hair loss? Some marketers say yes. There's only one reason why we lose our hair. Blood flow restriction to the hair follicle. That's it. Because of this reduced blood flow, the follicles become starved of oxygen. Other people say no way. The fundamental problem with hair loss is not blood flow. So what's the truth? Is low blood flow a cause or a consequence of hair loss? And should you even bother with treatments that try to increase circulation in the scalp? Well, as a medical editor specializing in hair loss disorders, it's time that we dive into this topic and give you the real answers. Hi, this is Rob English from Perfect Hair Health. And in today's video, we are going to reveal if low blood flow is a cause or a consequence of pattern hair loss. Now, <laughs> believe it or not, this question has stirred fervent debate online and across certain hair loss forums. And someone's answer to this question often tends to align with their belief systems on natural versus conventional treatment options. For instance, natural enthusiasts say that low blood flow is a cause of hair loss, which helps them justify their use of topicals like menthol, rosemary, and peppermint oil, because those things might improve circulation. Meanwhile, finasteride supporters say that reduced blood flow is associative, not causative to hair thinning, and that natural enthusiasts, they need to stop believing overhyped theories so that they can start seeking FDA approved treatments that actually work. Personally, I, <laughs> I kind of hate this sort of tribalistic thinking. So let's do everybody a service here and build the best argument for and against low blood flow as a cause of pattern hair loss. That way, nobody gets to decide for you, you get to choose what to believe. Because the evidence here is actually way more complex than what most people suggest. And as someone who regularly communicates with hair loss investigation groups, I can tell you that the jury is still out on this. Also, if you're fighting hair loss and you'd like to navigate to the facts, not fiction, about your treatment options, click the link below to sign up for our free 10-day email course on achieving hair regrowth with or without drugs. This is everything I wish I'd known back in 2007 when I was first diagnosed with pattern hair loss because if I'd had this information up front, I would have saved myself years of wasted time, money, and hair. First up, a bit of background. Pattern hair loss is perhaps the world's most common hair loss disorder. In fact, it's so common that you can't walk down a city block without spotting somebody with the condition. In men, it often presents as temple recession and a bald spot. In women, it's usually frontal diffuse thinning. But beyond its looks, pattern hair loss has a very definitive, very defining histological characteristic, hair follicle miniaturization. In other words, the diameter of hairs affected by pattern hair loss, well, they tend to get thinner and thinner and thinner over time until eventually these hairs become so thin that you can barely see them at all, at which point you're dealing with what most people describe as a bald scalp. Now, here's where things get interesting. Studies show that the scalps of men with pattern hair loss have 2.6 times less blood flow compared to those with healthy heads of hair. Other studies show that balding scalps have 40% lower oxygen levels. So this begs the question, are reductions to blood and oxygen levels causing hair follicle miniaturization? Again, that's the defining characteristic of pattern hair loss. Well, believe it or not, researchers from Brown University actually attempted to answer this question all the way back in 1959. In this study, the researchers set up a situation where they biopsied the scalps of men to see how hair follicles behaved at different parts of the hair cycle. And what is the hair cycle? Well, it's the natural, ever-repeating phenomenon where our hair follicles grow a hair, shed that hair, degenerate the old hair follicle, and then regenerate a new hair follicle, which produces a new hair that then grows and then sheds, and the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. So these researchers wanted to answer for every stage of the hair cycle, the growth stage, the resting stage, the shedding stage, they wanted to answer two key questions. Number one, is the hair still growing? And number two, is the hair still connected to its main blood supply? And what did they find? Well, contrary to their expectations, it was a puzzling discovery. These researchers actually found that 
hair follicles in the catagen or the resting stage. Well, the hair actually stops growing and then completely disconnects from its hair follicle base first. And only after that happens do these blood vessel networks supporting those hair follicles start to degenerate. In other words, the hairs begin the process of hair shedding even before the blood vessel networks start to collapse. And that means that blood vessels supporting a hair follicle do not degenerate until after the hair disconnects from its follicular base. Hair shedding initiates, then blood vessel networks degenerate. So that's important. It gives us a step process to hair shedding ordering. Now, here's where things get even more interesting. Throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, researchers consistently demonstrated that in pattern hair loss, hair follicle miniaturization, again, that's the defining characteristic of pattern hair loss. That's how the condition progresses, miniaturization. Well, the reductions to these hair diameters, they only occur right after hair shedding. In other words, hairs that are miniaturizing, they miniaturize right after a hair sheds, when the old hair follicle collapses, and then when a new hair follicle is coming in to replace the old one, this new hair follicle is just a little smaller than the last hair follicle. And subsequently, it has a smaller blood vessel network supporting it. And then that hair grows out, and then that hair sheds, and then the process repeats with a smaller hair follicle replacing that. And then that happens again, and again, and again, until you're dealing with what would be a vellus or white barely visible hair and the vascular network supporting these tiny, tiny, tiny hairs, they're barely there at all and the hair barely grows a millimeter out of the scalp. So why is this important? Well, for two reasons. First, it means that hairs cannot get thinner without hair shedding. And second, it means that hair shedding is what triggers the collapse of blood supply to the hair follicles and not the other way around. So to wrap this up, that means that lower blood flow is a consequence not a cause of hair follicle miniaturization. So that 2.6 fold lower blood flow that's observed in balding scalps, according to all of the research I just presented, that's the result of hair follicle miniaturization. That's not what's causing hair follicle miniaturization. So this is the best evidence that I've ever seen demonstrating that low blood flow is a consequence, not a cause of pattern hair loss. And in my opinion, it's incredibly compelling, even still. The story that I presented to you right now, it isn't the whole story. After all, the argument that we just built is what I would call pretty myopic. It focuses exclusively on one millimeter zones for each miniaturizing hair follicle. So what happens if we zoom out and start to evaluate all possible drivers of blood flow restrictions across the entire scalp? Well, this is where the low blood flow hair loss hypothesis starts to get more nuanced. In 1996, a group of clinical dermatologists published a study examining tissue oxygen levels in the scalps of balding versus non-balding men. They found that balding scalps had 40% lower oxygen levels than their non-balding counterparts. Again, no surprise here. I mean, we just covered this. Blood carries oxygen, and we just explained how reductions to blood flow are the consequences of hair follicle miniaturization, not the cause. But these researchers actually presented a different take. They actually hypothesized that these reductions to blood and oxygen, they, they were too great to explain just through hair cycling alone and miniaturization. Instead, this team argued that their results might indicate that there's some sort of structural impediment to blood flow in balding scalps. Specifically, they hypothesized that the muscles surrounding our scalp perimeter, anchored to what's called the galea aponeurotica, if these muscles are chronically and involuntarily contracted, well, they might pinch off branches of arterial networks that help to indirectly support the health of our hair follicles up top. They also presented mechanistic data showing that in low oxygenated environments, free testosterone can begin to favor conversion into DHT more so than it does estradiol because estradiol requires a mole of oxygen. And they said that that might help explain why DHT levels are elevated in balding scalps. Okay, it's a hypothesis and a unique one, but it's just an idea. And based on a small number of subjects in a study with no interventional data supporting these findings. In other words, to test the hypothesis here, Researchers would really need to find a way to relax this muscle band and see if A, blood flow levels in the scalp increase, and then B, if hair counts also improve. 
but they didn't do this, so it's all just speculation. Well, that is, it was speculation for over a decade until a research group led by Dr. Brian Frund decided to inject patients with pattern hair loss with botulinum toxin, also known as Botox, to help relax these muscle bands, take them out of chronic contraction, and see if patients of his saw any creases to hair counts. Fascinatingly, over a 10-month period, Dr. Frun's study demonstrated that Botox injections twice into these scalp perimeter muscles, well, they led to a 75% response rate and an 18% increase in hair counts. And these results, he said, were comparable to that of finasteride. And since then, four more studies on Botox have been published replicating Dr. Frun's original findings. And most uniquely, these are all in different research groups, different patient demographics, but all consistently demonstrating, on average, an 80% response rate and a 10 to 20% increase in hair counts. In fact, one of these studies even combined Botox with finasteride and found hair count increases of over 30%, suggesting that these two treatments, well, they paired synergistically, but they probably worked through two separate mechanisms. That's really exciting stuff, at least to me. And on that note, we have a literature review in its final stages of peer review discussing these findings on botulinum toxin. And I'm really excited to share this with you in the coming month or two. So stay tuned for that. We'll dive deep into that in a later video. So in my opinion, these are the strongest arguments for and against low blood flow as a causative agent to pattern hair loss. We see reductions of blood flow as a consequence directly surrounding miniaturization. Simultaneously, we see restrictions to blood flow caused by the contracted scalp perimeter muscles. And that the unclamping of these muscles can lead to relatively impressive hair count improvements for those with pattern hair loss. And since that hypothesis is that these scalp perimeter muscles pinch off and restrict blood supply to the tops of our scalps, we cannot simply declare that low blood flow is a cause or a consequence of pattern hair loss. In my eyes, both arguments might be right. It just depends on the scalp location you're talking about, directly surrounding the hair follicles or zooming out and looking at the scalp structure as a whole. Now, this is an important note. This does not mean that applying blood flow stimulating topicals like menthol, rosemary, and peppermint can actually regrow appreciable amounts of hair. Why? Well, think about what we just talked about. Applying topicals at the top of the head that attempt to improve blood flow, that's not the right region of target. In those locations, evidence shows that reduced blood flow is a consequence of hair follicle miniaturization, not a cause. And before you jump out of your seat, yes, I know that minoxidil is also a vasodilator and has been shown to increase hair counts when applied topically here and not here, but it's also a prostaglandin modulator. It's a potassium ion channel opener. And in all truthfulness, we have no idea how much of minoxidil's effects come from its ability to improve blood flow or its prostaglandin modulating activity or any of the other mechanisms. Our guess is that blood flow improvements, that's probably not the main mechanism of minoxidil, particularly given how poorly other topicals that attempt to target circulation stimulation perform as a treatment for pattern hair loss. So that is it. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe because next week we are going to be diving deep into antioxidants like C60, also known as carbon 60. Can these compounds improve hair growth? The answers might surprise you, and these compounds might actually be highly toxic when applied topically. Stay tuned, and if you have any questions, please reach out in the comments below. Thank you.